Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, hello, wherever you are. Uh, if you are watching this, you're probably one of the AGFM 2131 students from Durham College. Welcome to class. I'm going to present a PowerPoint lecture from February 14th. That's the Monday of this week. Pum, 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 pum. And share my video or share my screen. Ah, there we go. So I'm going to go to PowerPoint. And in PowerPoint, show what I've got. The lecture is on the germ theory of disease. The lecture follows the developments from last century and maybe time before on um, investigation of tuberculosis and anthrax mostly. Um, and the idea of germ theory disease. So I'll cover germ theory disease, the contributions of Louis Pasteur, the contributions of Robert Koch. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about salmonella, food poisoning, and um, the, the individual known as typhoid Mary, as well as end off the lecture with a little discussion on um, the foods that or the uh, microbes that can make you sick from the foods we eat. So microbes and as well as prions and infectious agents from foods. So that's the topic of this lecture. In this slide, you see an individual with a black lesion scab on his neck. This is a result of anthrax poisoning. So this individual has had exposure to bacillus anthracis in some manner and the, the uh, how you say the symptom of an anthrax infection is a scab that is black and shiny in color. And that's what this guy has uh, on the other side of the slide, I have an image where some people are in distress because they're taking care of a woman who is ill and the woman who is ill has tuberculosis. Uh, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the disease was referred to as consumption. And this is a chest infection that when it got into your chest, caused such bad um, coughing, congestion, that the person stopped being able to eat properly and also resulted in a loss of weight. And that's why it's called consumption is because they've lost so much of their weight. And I'll just maybe point this out. Oops, here. So this person laying down from being ill, being taking care of her parents and grandparent. And you can see they're very concerned. Um, also in this image, you can see that the window is open and this is one of the treatments of tuberculosis is that people thought that the air was important to be fresh air for people to recover. Okay, so let's talk about the germ theory of disease. Quick, uh, I guess there's review slides in this. Um, so what I'm going to do is perhaps just 
quickly go over review items and not go over the review questions. Um, but you can see them, answer them at your own time because this is not me recording uh, as a group. I'm just recording this as a presentation. Um, so one of the words from the first test was this word vector. And what is a vector? A vector is any biological organism that carries infectious pathogens from one organism to another organism. And this could include uh, mechanical transmission where the microbes are attached to the fingers of a person and the person acts as a vector spreading the disease from one location to another, or it could be the movement of microbes through bodily fluid. So if um, one sick individual is bitten by a parasite and the parasite takes in the sick organisms, the, the organisms that cause the disease, and then travels to another organism, bites an individual like in Lyme disease and passes on the disease, that's a biological transmission. So there's mechanical and mechanical transmission of uh, as a working as vectors. And like I was saying, the transmission of Lyme disease is one, a smoker leaving tobacco mosaic virus from his cigarette to other healthy plants. That's another example. And the third example could be cats um, acting as a vector in the toxoplasma life cycle where a mouse could be infected with a parasite that causes toxoplas toxoplasmosis. This parasite toxoplasma gondii um, is in the mouse. The cat eats the mouse, ingests the mouse. The cat then sheds feces and the feces carry the parasite and so the cat has acted as the vector for the parasite. And if somebody were to change the cat's litter box, then they could be exposed to the parasite. So those are examples of vectors. Um, we have a theory referred to as germ theory and clearly stated Germ theory can involve any microbe and the microbe will cause illness. So for example, you can have protozoa, yeast causing infection or illness, bacteria causing infection or illness, viruses or prions all causing infection or illness. Um, I did talk a little bit about the pandemic the word pandemic coming from pan for all, like Pandora or Pandemonia, Panacea, um, and demos. This was like two Greek words there, that like democratic, demographic, endemic. Uh, so pandemic is like all people affected by this kind of illness. And I made the slide in March of 2020, and what I was doing is trying to kind of inform the class of what the pandemic basis was, why we're closing down school. And I shared the symptoms from 2020, and here's a slide from 2020, and as well as this year, I went to Wikipedia and the common symptoms for COVID-19 have changed. As you can see on the right, I have common symptoms being fever, dry cough, and fatigue. And now the common symptoms, fever, cough, and fatigue are still there, but there's also loss of appetite, loss of smell, shortness of breath, coughing up sputum from the lungs, and muscle aches and pains. So those are now all recognized as common symptoms. Um, they may have been recognized as common, uncommon symptoms a few years ago, but 
these are now being recognized as being common symptoms. And in the severity of, in the severe disease, these are the symptoms. So 2020, if you had, a, uh, it was understood that the severe case of the disease was high fever, coughing of blood, decreased white blood cells and kidney failure. And that's fairly close to what it is now. But in severe disease, we also have this other um, symptom and that's difficulty walking or confusion. And there seems to be some uh, relation with it affecting thought processes because it's affecting the brain somehow. That's not entirely clear. Um, this bluish face or lips, that's a severe disease symptom. Again, coughing up blood is similar to what it was before. The persistent chest pains, what we recognized in 2020, um, decreased white blood cells, kidney fever, and high fever. There's so some matching, some new sort of information. Um, and here's a map of what the disease looked like at 2020, closed the school that week, uh, right around St. Patrick's Day, 2020. Um, there were 120,000 confirmed cases. I'm looking at the slide, I'm thinking that would probably be in the United States, they noted. And then uh, March 17th, I took another picture. I took another picture in 2021. Um, by that time, there is last year in March, 120,000, uh, sorry, 120 million cases. This year, uh, at this point in time, confirmed cases include about 400 million cases. So this is what we're living with and living through. Um, the reason I include that is I'm talking about disease. So I just wanted to introduce what we're <laughs> going through right now. Um, this is a review, like I said, I'll just go over that. Uh, you can take a look at the questions of routine media, selective media, differential media. Um, it's from lecture five. Also, I talked about poor plate and street plate. And I also asked about how you would directly count microbes. What is the purpose of agar in a petri dish when we're growing meat? Uh, microbes, and how are the two different kinds of media, complex media, different from chemical media? Okay, so we have here um, the lecture outline. I'm talking, like I said, about germ theory, Louis Pester, Robert Koch, salmonella, and biological agents in food. So here we go with the germ theory. The germ theory, I can, I often talk about the word miasma. When I talk about miasma, I'm talking about the definition of miasma being bad air. So at one point in time, it was thought that people got sick because they ingested or inhaled some bad air. If you walk through a swamp, if you walk through some place where there's bad air, typically in cities, typically, uh, places where you could smell rot or maybe animal droppings. So people thought that bad air caused disease. Um, you become diseased maybe because it was the will of God or they didn't have the scientific description of what is going on 300 years ago. And that has only developed over time. And it's because we now have microscopes. We can take a look at small particles and follow what they're doing. Uh, here's a picture from eBay. 
you can go buy a steampunk costume for a plague doctor. And I just wanted to show how back in 1600s, 1500s, they believed that uh, in order to prevent disease spreading to doctors, doctors or um, people taking, tending to sick individuals needed to protect themselves. And so they'd wear these leather outfits that had special cones that allowed you to breathe perfumed air because you would be confronted by um, decaying flesh or putrefying flesh. And so you want to have <laughs> um, protection against that. The idea of disease has frequently thought of as being something that is imported. People don't accept the idea that the disease could orig originate at their locale. They frequently, in the past, blamed it on travelers. So in my image here, there's an individual who is bringing death to a city and he's on a ship and you can see there's a British flag on the ship. And so once he arrives to the port, the disease can spread to the people who are coming to meet him. That's kind of an, um, the old portrayal of what disease is like. And here's another image you can see here, malaria, smallpox, leprosy in the place Chinatown. Uh, yeah, so, so they have features that may be considered to be oriental features or foreign features of some sort. And again, coming and arriving by ship into a port. So this image here comes from uh, a magazine called The Wasp in San Francisco back in the 1800s. So this is an old idea. And look here, I've got a cartoon. Um, You've got two individuals crossing the US border and what is coming along with them, three diseases. So the diseases are asking if they um, these individuals mind that the diseases tag along with them and cross into the United States. So even now we're, cons uh, we're blaming travelers on introducing disease into our societies. Um, one word that we're getting from this idea that it comes from outside is the word quarantine. As many of you have already heard, the word quarantine from Italian word for 40, um, what they would do is they would uh, if a ship came into port, any sign of disease, individuals would have to stay on the boat for 40 days, allow the sickness to be on all of the ship passengers so that the safety of the town, the port was insured. So they would have to stay 40 days in quarantine away from other people. That's what we had is, uh, so we've had bad air, we've had outsiders, but in the 1800s, Louis Pasteur came up with this germ theory of disease. And it's one sentence, I always ask this on a test, the germ theory of disease, what is it? It stated that many diseases are caused by microorganisms. So diseases are caused by microbes or viruses, right? So that's the germ theory of disease. Now, we didn't know this before we had microscopes, and that's why we have the uh, explanation of disease being introduced by travelers or by bad air. Uh, 
but now we have microscopes studied it a lot more. Now we understand that it can be coming from microbes. Um, the word germ in, refers to infectious agents and the infectious agents can be viruses, bacteria, eukaryotes like fungus and fungus fungi could include yeast or mold as well as other kinds of protozoa. Now, if you were part of lab this week, you'll have seen al excuse me, algae and yeast, mold, protozoa under the microscope. Um, these things can cause disease, so we have to treat them with respect. If you are exposed to a microbe that can cause disease, well, we refer to the microbe as a pathogen. So that's a definition of what is the pathogen. Microbes that cause disease are called pathogens. Now, what is the disease called if you have a disease caused by a pathogen? Well, that's referred to as an infectious disease because you got infected by that pathogen. Um, pathogenic growth, reproduction, cause disease. So the pathogens inside, they multiply and based on how they reproduce, take over the cells, cause damage um, that causes individual to become ill. And that was what we refer to as our disease from the, from the pathogen. Um, people in the 1600s, they had an idea that there was germs that were causing diseases, but it's only after we had the microscopes that we can actually say that with certainty that um, pathogens, the microbes are causing the disease. Okay, so there's my review question. What is germ theory? Explain what is miasmatic air, what are germs? And what are pathogens and infectious diseases? Carry on. Louis Pasteur is an individual that we refer to when we're studying um, microbiology on account of his work with alcohol, anthrax, rabies, and vinegar. So let's take a look. Pasteur, Louis Pasteur was a French chemist. As a French chemist, he studied the crystals found in wine. People came to him with wine and in, uh, he also had a lot of contributions to the field of chemistry. Uh, he came up with the idea of molecules having chirality. Okay, so that's his uh, chemistry contribution, but he's also really important with microbiology contribution. Um, He is really well known for his contribution and technique of treating milk and wine to stop bacteria contamination. And that's what we call pasteurization. So if you heat treat milk, it's safe to drink because you've killed off the spoilage organisms or organisms that could potentially cause disease. And because of his contributions to bacteriology, uh, he and Robert Koch are referred to as fathers of microbiology. Um, back in the, before Pasteur's time, 1600s, 1700s, all the way back <laughs> to the Greeks, uh, Persian, really ancient sort of, thoughts, uh, people had this idea of spontaneous generation. So what the heck is that? Um, spontaneous generation is the thought that living organisms descend from other organisms. So what does that mean? These things just spontaneously come up. 
For example, you, let's say you have some uh, dead flesh. So you have some meat, set that on the counter and come back a couple of days later. The dead flesh is now active with life in the form of maggots. So where did those maggots come from? They came from the flesh. This is, that was the thought. They just spontaneously came. Um, if you had dead leaves on the ground, in a couple of days, you disturb the leaves, you have frogs. Where did the frogs come from? Well, the frogs must be a life form from the leaves. Uh, here's another one. Let's say you have some dirty shirt and maybe some food laying around. Well, what you do is you lay that on the floor. Maybe in a, three weeks later, you have mice. So this is a spontaneous generation argument that the mice were in the wheat and clothing and somehow just spontaneously arrived. So obviously that's wrong. We now understand where these things come from because we've observed them a lot more carefully. Um, glass really helped. <laughs> and if you contain things in glassware, things don't get spoiled or contaminated. This was shown by Louis Pasteur's disproval of spontaneous generation. Now, in this slide, uh, this is an important slide in that I always ask this as a longer, ask, longer answer question on a test. What is the boiled beef broth experiment? Well, what you do is you take beef broth, beef soup, and if you take beef broth, set it on the counter, open to the environment, the beef broth will spoil. That's kind of a reliable thing. If you take the beef broth, put it into a glass vessel and seal it, boil it and seal it, the beef broth does not spoil, or at least not as fast. <laughs> so um, this is the advent of canning back in the late 1700s that you could boil things, cook food in jars, seal it, and distribute it. Um, I'm actually here to early 1800s too, because Napoleon's army survived by the invention of canning. Um, and the British invention was canning using metal cans. So they could seal cooked food inside of a metal can. Um, preventing contamination. This is a great idea of preserving your food. In this experiment, an individual suggested to Louis Pasteur that he do two things. Try using a flask with a long straight tube. Set that on the counter, see what happens. Um, and in another case, you have a flask with a beef broth. And in this case, you have an S-shaped tube. Observe what happens. Now, if you boil beef broth in a flask that is open to the air, like the picture, one picture number one, that will get contaminated. If you boil it and then seal it, it will stay non, it won't spoil um, after you've sealed it. It'll stay intact. Now, if you have a container, a vessel that has an S shaped tube and boil it, what happens is you've expelled or you've killed any microbes in your beef broth, boil them off, 
and then any air that lands in the tube lands at the bottom of the S shape of the flask. And those microbes can't travel up the flask tube and into the beef broth. So the beef broth stays clear of microbes. So this experiment proved that you can maintain the freshness of your food. Organisms do not spontaneously generate in your food. So there is a way to prevent spoilage. Um, other developments, um, Louis Pasteur involved alcohol and vinegar. What you do is you have vinegar uh, and from wine. Now, if you have vinegar coming from wine it, or beer, it could be referred to as a disease of wine and beer. So your wine is spoiled, now it's vinegar. Now, we understand that you can treat wine and beer, filter it of its uh, other impure organisms, and then provide it with yeast. Um, after that, that will allow your wine or beer to ferment properly and not spoil. So that's what, excuse me, pardon me, Pasteur showed is that if you boil unfermented liquids and then ferment them in a sterile container, you've prevented vinegar from forming. You've prevented the disease of wine and beer. Um, he showed that vinegar, or also referred to as sour wine, contained an organism that always showed up at the same time, Acetobacter aceti. And studying Acetobacter aceti showed that vinegar is formed when these microbes take over. Before Pasteur, there was some thought that the uh, chemicals within the wine spontaneously formed the vinegar. But Pasteur showed very definitively, it's these bacteria that form inside of the fermented wine. And because they consume the fermented wine, they generate the compounds that give um, vinegar its flavor. And so if you look at all of the good wine in your winery, you notice that there's no Acetobacter aceti in it. But if you have wine that's boiled into vinegar, it does have these microbes. Fairly, fairly straightforward demonstration of um, what good wine is. With the industrialized cities having more need for more nutrition because the workers needed to be healthy, um, there's a demand for fresh milk. And fresh milk was also thought to heal people. And so what they would do is they would bring fresh milk to places like sanatoriums and uh, give patients fresh milk. But it wasn't always a safe drink. And Pasteur showed that uh, what you could do is you could boil the raw milk, or at least get it to a certain temperature. And then after you heat it, you store it in a sterile container. What that does is you've prevented the milk from turning sour. And you've prevented the milk from um, causing infection. Because if you have just raw, unpasteurized milk, you could also spread diseases like salmonella, um, get food poisoning from E. coli or listeriosis from uh, listeria monocytogenes, or even tuberculosis from unpasteurized milk. So by having pasteurized milk, you have prevented these diseases from spreading to people. And you might ask, is this really important? 
it was important even in Canada. Back in the 1920s, uh, they had typhoid epidemics. So you feed your population contaminated milk and you can cause 5,000 people to get sick just as there were in Montreal. In fact, 500 people who got uh, sick from milk pasteurized, um, unpasteurized milk caused a movement in public health in Canada that all milk should be pasteurized. And so by the 1930s in Canada, the legislators passed laws that say you can only sell pasteurized milk. Um, with the study of milk, they also realized that people weren't getting enough of the nutrients from the milk. So they also threw in an extra ingredient. They added vitamin D. And what that does is allow more absorption of the nutrients, especially uh, calcium absorption. And so adding vitamin D was legislated as well to come with our milk. Oh, it's a feel good story. <laughs> we have safe milk now. Um, Louis Pasteur also did work on chickens. And you're gonna ask, why would we care about uh, chicken diseases? Well, there's a cholera that chickens can spread. Um, the cholera is caused by a bacteria called Pasteurella, uh, see it was named after him, Pasteur, Pasteurella multocida. And this is a bacteria that is caucus shaped. And this cholera, what the people in his lab did was they'd take sick chickens, um, remove some of their flesh, culture that onto some culture material, uh, like a petri dish of some sort. And they'd grow the bacteria on the petri dish, and then they'd take fresh culture, inject that into chickens, and the chickens would die because they would capture the disease, the uh, chicken cholera disease. Now, a technician who is responsible for the plates, the making of this media and these uh, petri dishes with the bacteria on them, instead of throwing the plates away before he went on holidays, he allowed them to stay on his bench, went on vacation, a couple weeks later, a month later, come back and thought, oh, well, I still have these cultures. Let me just try them to see if I can still get, see if they'll still work. And sure enough, the chickens um, they, they may have shown illness for a day or so, but they quickly recovered and they survived. And so this caused the thought that, oh, well, if these bacteria cultures are old, then they lose their virulence, they lose their strength. And so one way of preventing chickens from getting cholera is to inoculate them with a weakened strain. If you do that, you've improved the chicken's health so that they may have been exposed to the bacteria, but they're capable of surviving the infection. Um, here I say, chickens only show mild signs of the disease. Yeah. And if you take fresh culture, and fresh bacteria, inject the chickens with that, the chickens don't get sick. So it's promoting healthy chickens. Then um, in this very similar manner, we have a color vaccine you may have seen advertised on television, Ducarol. If you're traveling abroad, you may have a Ducarol vaccine. There's also Shankel and Uvicol Plus. So there's other vaccines that um, help us recover from cholera infections because cholera can be extremely uh, aggressive, causing 
violent diarrhea, vomiting, fever, aches, and uh, it's something you don't want on your holidays. So you can get vaccinated against the cholera that's out there. Um, Pasteur also, in a similar way, developed a vaccine for anthracis for people. So uh, I'm not going to talk about that so much, the, his uh, anthrax vaccine, but I will talk about rabies vaccine. So here's an example of a rabies virus and the rabies virus. So you can see here um, affects somebody in the spinal fluid and eventually the virus travels to the brain. So what are the symptoms of a rabies infection? Fever, agitation, spasms, uh, saliva. And if it isn't vaccinated and if it's not treated, a person, an individual can die within a week. Um, we talked about this in class. And uh, I just want to say thanks for sharing the rabies story with us. It was shared that if a person was bitten by a dog that was suspected of having rabies, the people who got bitten, and usually kids, because kids playing in the yard, playing outside, um, they would have be forced to take a series of 25 needles to the stomach. This is it's a lovely number uh, to attempt to kill off the rabies infection. Um, so what did Pasteur do? Emile Roux and Louis Pasteur, two individuals who worked on the vaccine. Uh, Emile Roux had this infected rabbit nerve tissue. So he purposefully made rabbits sick with rabies, dry the tissue down, and then take the tissue from the rabbits so after the rabbits died, you remove the nerve tissue, resuspend it into a liquid, and then take that and um, inject that into dogs. And you can prevent rabies in dogs. Like if a dog is bitten, um, with the rabies virus, inject them with this material, you can prevent the dog from dying of rabies. And Pasteur took a risk and injected a child who was bitten by a rabid dog and the child survived. And so he set up an institute in France to treat people with rabies. Rabies is so fast acting, you'd have to get the people there quickly. Okay, there's review questions. And I'll just carry on with the next person, Robert Koch. Robert Koch was a German scientist. At the time, his part of the world was referred to as Prussia. Um, now it's later was Eastern Germany and Poland. And uh, now he's no, known as a German microbiologist. Um, he identified that single microbes cause disease and the diseases include anthrax, tuberculosis and cholera. So we have his contribution to those diseases. Um, what I'm going to share with you is treatment of anthrax as well as the treatment of tuberculosis. 
and also his four rules of disease study. Uh, we refer to it as uh, Cox postulates. In his lab, he also grew microbes on petri dishes. You remember, petri dishes came, the idea of petri dishes came from Dr. Petri from his lab. Uh, you have two different glass dishes. And the idea of um, agar into the petri dishes came from Franny, Fanny Hess, who also worked in his lab. And the use of agar allowed people to grow bacteria and isolate single pure organisms. And that was Robert Koch's contribution is he showed that these one single organisms were responsible for disease. And like I was saying earlier, um, he was a military doctor. So during the war between France and Prussia, is a military doctor in a district of Wolsten, and which is now in Poland. Next slide. So here's a hand-drawn slide, just like I would ask people to draw in lab um, of what is observed under a microscope. So if this is anthrax, you can see there's threads there. Uh, when it's very, very young, the threads are long threads. Then when the threads have time to develop and grow, you have beads on string. And then given enough time, these beads emerge as larger beads and there's more threads. So parallel threads of bacillus microbes, what they do is they mature and differentiate and they form these spherical spores. So you have these long rods attached in chains and they form little bumps as spores on the chains. Um, the spores are important because if you have these spores in soil, you can make them wet, dry over many years, wet and dry over many cycles, and they survive robustly in the soil. And so this is why anthrax is such a horrible problem in soil, is that you have these spores in soil and they can dry and get wet for years and survive still. So the spores are very, very robust. Now, if you have an anthrax infection, you can have uh, two forms. Oh, actually a couple of forms. One form is referred to as wool gatherers disease. And now what wool gatherers would do is, in factories is they'd take the wool and they'd have to clean the wool just to make it all kind of in the same direction to be put onto instruments to be woven together. Well, the wool gatherers had a common blood poisoning. And what they would do is the anthrax that would, may have been in the wool would get into their lungs and it could be a fatal disease for somebody who is a wool gatherer. If it was detected, oftentimes within four days, they were dead. Um, one of the symptoms was just sudden death. So wool gathering was a fairly dangerous occupation back in the 17 and 1800s. Um, if you have livestock eating in swampy areas or overgrazed regions, especially in like areas where you get the liquids pooling, valleys, um, the animals will get sick in their stomach. They get gastrointestinal diseases and the gastrointestinal diseases be caused by anthrax. So there's pulmonary, there's gastrointestinal, then Farmers could also, if they work on the soil, they get lesions on their hands or arms or faces or necks, just like you saw in the very first slide of this lecture. And these lesions would look like uh, black coal and the uh, black coal 
shiny black coal is referred to as anthracis coal. So uh, that's where they get the name of anthrax from. The skin anthrax is from the anthrax coal. Um, so there's a cutaneous form as well. So cutaneous being skin form. So skin form, lungs, uh, airways, as well as stomach. There's three different kinds of infections for anthrax. And based on what Koch observed, he figured out that these spores infected the animals from soil. So it's like an idea that, okay, the soil is contaminated somehow. You have to treat the soil in some manner. And in one location where he was working, um, 50,000 livestock died of anthrax, he figured, and 500 people died of anthrax. So just in four years, that's a lot of people dying of anthrax poisoning. And what do I say here? Um, so he linked anthrax disease, which is a very specific microbe with the disease. So again, a microbe causing disease, this is like the germ theory. These little microbes cause the disease. It's not the soil, it's not the water, it's not the air, it's these microbes. Um, these spores, could stay dormant, meaning they're in a non-growing form. And when they start changing into a growing form that's referred to as a vegetative form, then that's its uh, reactivated form. That's when these bacteria get bad, become bad. So again, we're rejecting the idea of spontaneous generation and it's the germ theory. How did he maintain um, or, or come up with this idea. So he could, he had a method of growing anthrax on potatoes. Uh, he would take the bacteria, infect, uh, inject it into a sheep. The sheep could get sick, die of an anthrax infection. And then what you he could do is take the uh, blood or serum, uh, serum from a sheep that had the infection, inject that into a mouse, and then that would die. Then he would take a look at the mouse, um, and observe it under the microscope, and find, yes, the anthrax is in that mouse. So he showed this is very specifically caused by this bacteria but he didn't have a really good way of keeping the live bacteria. I was mentioning that he grew it on potatoes, but potatoes dry. Um, so he struggled with how to maintain the cultures. Fanny helped with that. With um, Fanny has helped with that with the invention of Petri dishes using agar with potato dextrose agar. And so um, now he has a Later, he had a way of keeping it alive, but here's another way he kept it alive. What he was, do, what he could do, is um, to find a sheep that died from an infection, take serum or um, some of the microbes from that sheep, and inject that stuff into a rabbit or cow eyeball. Sounds cruel, but the microbes in that eyeball, um, for some reason, rabbits and cow eyeball can get infected with anthrax and not spread to the rest of the body. So what he could do is he maintain these rabbits. Um, and if you take a rabbit, remove the bacteria from the rabbit's eyeball, put it into another rabbit, take that bacteria, remove it, and put it into another rabbit. You could inject a mouse, repeat that 20 times, and he proved that by doing this 
20 different times, you are showing that this anthrax, yes, kills mice or is very deadly, the deadly biological agent. So he showed that the anthrax differentiate into spores or the anthrax mature in four spores. The spores are tough. And so your field could have unhealthy soil. So um, instead of taking your animals, burying them in the field, propose that people incinerate the animal, then take the ashes from the sick animals instead of uh, burying sick animals just as they were, incinerate them, put the ashes in the field, cover the ashes with lye solution. And the lye solution uh, prevented any spores from forming because the bacteria required a neutral environment and this would destroy the, uh, the anthrax bacteria and prevent any future contamination. So he would help fields become healthy again, as well as people. All right, so that's the idea of anthrax. My next idea is uh, consumption. So there's this tuberculosis disease. Here's a woman who looks very gaunt. Um, if you have tuberculosis, it's also referred to as consumption. People become thin, weak, very pale, almost the 1800s picture of a vampire, right? Oh, it looks like a very sick individual right there recovering from tuberculosis. So the chest infection comes up, you have a bloody cough and you cough to death because the bacteria cause lesions in your lungs. Um, doctors would tell people to move into the country because the air in the country is better than the air in the city because the air in the cities were thought to have miasmatic air. Um, and I have this little point that tuberculosis even influence fashion because you get sick, you get emaciated uh, and pale. So this became a, a look for people in the 1800s, emaciated and pale. So you could have these corset dresses for really skinny people. Now, this is a tubercule. I told you that people would essentially cough to death because they would have these lesions in their lungs. Well, this is a, a lesion under a magnus, uh, magnification. So uh, I found this image from Robert Cox, actual hand-drawn work. And in it, he's showing there's these strings of rods, bacterial rods, that form as almost strings in a comma shape. So what he's done is he's taken somebody's lungs after they've died and he's found one of these tubercules, sliced it, put it on a microscope slide and examined it underneath the microscope to kind of see what's going on with this tubercule. And so he's done the autopsy on this person's lung and you can see the rod-shaped bacteria there. So this tubercule has kind of like a comma shape to it. And he showed that these tubercules have these bacteria. What he would then do is take the lung tissue remove some of the bacteria and grow pure cultures in the lab. He would use a coagulated blood serum on his agar plates, grow that for two weeks, and then uh, 
you could take that bacteria, infect other animals and confirm that yes, this bacteria causes disease. Um, another way of transmitting the disease, what he did was he would inoculate animals and then he would recover their spit and then infect other animals with their spit. And that showed that spit also transmit diseases. Then what he did was he uh, thought, well, if spit could just transmit the disease. What about dried spit? And so he'd have a healthy animal, inoculate them, they become sick, take out their spit, and then he would dry the spit off and allow that to sit for a couple of weeks. Then he would recover that, put it into another animal, and yes, that was contagious and infectious as well. So he showed that dried spit or sputum is also pathogenic and that can stay pathogenic for weeks. It can remain as potentially harmful for a long time. Why is that important? Um, well, we have in the ninth, yeah, late 1800s, early 1900s, these big buildings that have rooms that allow people to stay outside uh, called sanatoriums to help people with tuberculosis recover from tuberculosis because they thought that open air was really, really important for people to recover. And that was the image that I showed at the beginning is here's a woman. This photo shows the family kind of suffering, very concerned for her well-being, having her stay by an open window, trying to recover from the tuberculosis infection. Um, based on Cox's work, he showed that spit and sweat could be ways of transmitting the disease. So it was important to sterilize clothes and bed sheets. And this is something that hospitals now do. It wasn't as common before this. It was insisted upon his uh, work after he showed it to hit its common way to spread the disease. Also, we have new bylaws in public places. Spitting is no longer allowed. So he's showing that you can't spit. You have to keep your clothes, uh, bed sheets clothes, um, bed sheets clean. So cleanliness is really important. And um, so he contributed towards public health. There's a little YouTube video on uh, tuberculosis as well here, if you want to take a look at that. Um, and he also did work on cholera outbreaks, showing how cholera is spread by infected water, untreated water. Now, his contribution, we always referred to as uh, Cox postulates. And I'll just share that in the next slide. So uh, he got a prize here that's uh, the Nobel Prize for Medicine. For, they thought that he, his work would lead to a cure for tuberculosis. And it wasn't immediately after 1905, it took another 20 years before, 30 years before tuberculosis would be cured with uh, antibiotics. That'll come up in another lecture. So what are Cox postulates? Cox postulates, um, I explained it as it's a repetitive process. And this is an important slide. This is always a really good question to ask. When I say it's a repetitive process, you recover the microbes from a sick animal. You grow that in pure culture in the lab. 
and you confirm that that's the culture by a microscope. And then you take the culture, infect a second animal. That animal will become ill. Then you take that ill animal, remove its uh, maybe blood or lung tissue, grow the microbes on a Petri dish and examine those microbes to see if it's the same bacteria. Now, you've re-isolated the bacteria from, a sick, from, from um, the original animal that got sick. So one more time, microorganisms in the organism that has the disease, but it's not in healthy animals. So you recover the microorganism from the diseased organism and grow it in pure culture. So that pure culture is really important. Then you take the culture microorganism and you can cause disease in a healthy animal. So it's healthy, injected with the microbe, it becomes sick. Then you take the sick animal and identify the bacteria by growing another pure culture from that animal. And you notice that you perform the microscopy, the microbes are exactly the same as the animal from the first sick animal. So it's kind of like um, rather rinse, rather rinse, repeat, you know, you, you do something and then just repeat it. Do something, process it, repeat it. So you can I find a dead animal, recover the bacteria, identify the bacteria, grow that bacteria, use that bacteria to make another animal sick, recover the bacteria from the sick animal, confirm that that bacteria is the same as the first bacteria. So four steps. Try and remember those steps. Okay, next slide. Review questions, define Cox postulates. One, two, three, four. How did he find the cause of anthracis? Remember that was in the fields. What was the cause of tuberculosis? That was in the tubercules of the sick individuals. And two suggestions for public health. And I talked about anthrax and tuberculosis. Okay, so that's Robert Cox's contributions to microbiology. Next, I'll talk a little bit about salmonella. And then finally, a little bit about biological agents in food. Salmonella. Salmonella is a microbe that lives in lots of livestock. It can live in cows, chickens, ducks, turtles, sheep, no sheep in this picture, hmm. pigs, cats, dogs. So they can live in halal livestock as well as your pets or animals. Um, there's two major strains, Salmonella enterica and the serotypes typhi. Uh, that could cause what's referred to as typhoid fever as well as Salmonella. And the SPP here just means it's a species of Salmonella. There's several different species of Salmonella. So when they write Salmonella SPP, it's just, these are very much like Salmonella, but this one is very specific to Typhi. Um, salmonella as a bacteria survives without oxygen, but it also tolerates oxygen. So that's referred to as a facultative uh, anaerobe. It has a rod shape, it's gram negative rod. So it would be uh, red if you did a gram stain, doesn't form spores and it can survive being refrigerated and frozen dehydrated for a lot, long period of time, but it can be killed by heat. Uh, here's a picture of what it looks like on a uh, 
XLD agar plate. And the XLD agar is a way of showing off um, salmonella. What are some of the symptoms? Symptoms are fever, headache, diarrhea within six to three days of getting infected. It's really hard on old people. It can survive in your gallbladder. So if you get infected, you could have the infection in your gallbladder for a long period of time. It can also travel to your urinary tract or your blood or your brain. Um, why is it bad? Because people handle meat and poultry and unpasteurized milk. And for eggs, there's a really large problem with eggs. The fecal material from a hen can contaminate the outside of an egg from the hen's cloaca. So um, when it passes the egg, the eggshell can get contaminated. And so if you break the egg shell, the egg, because it's contaminated, can get you sick. Um, but it can also pass into the egg. So there are cases where they've shown that one in 20,000 eggs <laughs> can have seminal inside them. So this is why you have to be careful with mayonnaise because if you make fresh mayonnaise with egg whites, um, and you emulsify that with the oil and consume that, what happens is it's, you have a potential of getting a salmonella infection, especially if you don't consume that right away. This is a problem with mayonnaise, that if you make fresh mayonnaise, it should be refrigerated right away or consumed right away. So the lesson there is always wash your vegetables. Thanks. So here's a story about uh, one individual who's famous for having passed on salmonella poisoning. So salmonellaosis is uh, from eating contaminated food. Um, it can be spread from one person to another person. And in the case of typhoid Mary, uh, she was an individual who was found to have salmonella and she cooked for people. And wherever she cooked for people, people got sick. So whether it was her skin or she breathed the bacteria out somehow, uh, that's not clear, but she was a carrier of some the typhi version of salmonella and people died after she had cooked for them. And this is kind of a sad story about how uh, she worked as a cook. She didn't show any signs of the disease. She cared for the people who uh, got sick and the courts um, public scientists tracked her down because she was the person who was cooking at these houses um, and they ordered her to stop cooking. She stopped cooking for a while but couldn't make ends meet so she went back to cooking assumed um, and people became sick under her care again and died and so they confined her to a quarantined hospital so she and where she was not allowed to leave. So she spent the rest of her life in quarantine. Um, and if you want to read this or watch the story, here's a YouTube video of it. We'll show that in class next day. So how do you avoid salmonella poisoning? Um, it's the, if you have an infected employee, don't ha let them handle it. Acidify your food. So if you add a little bit of vinegar, that'll help maintain the uh, 
maintain the bacteria at a state that is not growing or multiplying. Thoroughly wash your fruit and vegetables. If you cook your food, that'll destroy the bacteria. So you inhibit the bacteria by adding vinegar and you can use sanitizers to clean your kitchen counters and pasteurize your raw eggs or milk. Okay, so there's ways of preventing salmonella poisoning. There's even regulations last two or uh, three years ago in 2019, because a lot of people were getting salmonella poisoning. Now the uh, grocery stores require in Canada, any frozen breaded chicken to be cooked. So partially cooked chicken products, nuggets, strips, because people didn't cook them long enough. So they had to sell more cooked chicken. Okay, so here's the questions. What is an asymptomatic carrier? Like I said, Mary Mellon had no symptoms of the disease, yet she was passing the disease from one person to another. And this is the term asymptomatic. You may have heard this during the pandemic. What is asymptomatic is like you have the disease, but you don't show the symptoms. I also asked animals that have salmonella, uh, and what is Canadian legislation? Why is it about the bacteria? What is it, not why is it? What is it about bacteria that make it hard to get rid of some menolosis? Or it could survive freezing, right? Okay, last little topic, biological agents and food. I'm not going to go over this too much. Um, there's an assignment quiz it talks a lot about these organisms. Follow the assignment and you'll have a better understanding of what some food-based microbes are. Um, there's a couple of ideas I want to share here. So bacteria have toxins. Um, you can also get an infection from bacteria. So what's the difference between the two? I'll talk about that. And I'll talk a little bit about fungi and how fungi can pass on disease. And let's take a, let's take a look. So here's some bacteria. I talked about Bacillus cereus in a previous class. Um, it's abbreviated as B. cereus. I always find that kind of funny thing, B. cereus. There's a bacteria called Campylobacter jejuni, um, referred to in the chicken industry as campy. If you have a campy infection, it's can be serious. Clostridium botulinum is a gut bacterium. There's another one, Clostridium perforentians, often accompanied in gravy. Asterichia coli is a bacteria. We may have heard of the old. 15787 strain being responsible for the deaths and illnesses in Walkerton, Ontario. Um, there's a large outbreak of Listeria monocytogenes after a maple leaf foods outbreak of this bacteria. So there's several bacteria that cause hazards. Uh, Salmonella, I just talked about, Staph aureus, which is a skin based organism, and Vibrio cholera. Uh, cholera. So what is foodborne intoxication? It's a disease of a foodborne infection. Now, you can get um, toxins making you sick. So if you have a toxin making you sick, bacteria form toxins and they produce these toxins as a result of their growth. And sometimes you can deactivate the toxins, but not always. Sometimes you can cook your food thoroughly and still the toxins are active. So in the case of Staph aureus, the skin organism, Clostridium botulinum, 
botulism. So you, you have your can of food, you cook the food, you don't cook it quite long enough, but it's uh, been cooked to 100 degrees Celsius and uh, under pressure for maybe not long enough to destroy the spores, you can get botulinum from that. Um, if you get ill from ingesting the toxin, that's referred to as a food, foodborne intoxication because it's a toxin living on your food. So here are some organisms that produce toxins. Bacillus cereus, like I talked about before, causes uh, rice to spoil, and you can leave that just for a couple of hours. So that's why you have to put rice away immediately after you cook it. E. coli uh, can affect fruit, vegetables, untreated water, beef, especially beef. Staph aureus um, affects dairy, poultry, pastries, and Clostridium botulinum in canned foods. The botulinum is really dangerous in canned foods. So in food infection is your inflammation of the stomach and bowels. So this is a slightly different than food intoxication that I was just talking about, because those are toxins. The food infection um, is contaminating food is being ingested. So you have uh, parasites or viruses or bacteria and get a food infection. So here's some bacteria that cause food infections, Listeria monocytogenes, what kind of food? Sprout deli meat. And the deli meat was the one that affected maple leaf foods. Um, and unpasteurized dairy products. And there's salmonella, Vibrio cholera, which affects water and raw foods, Campylobacter jejuni, salmonella I talked about earlier with Mary Mellon. Um, Campylobacter jejuni is poultry uh, concern. And it's also a concern with unpasteurized milk as well as water. Clostridium perfringens. This is a very important microbe that survives in gravy. So it's uh, common in gravy sickness. So if you're sick because you had some gravy, it could be clustering and perforingens. So what are some symptoms of infection? Nausea, vomiting, cramps, that sort of thing. What kind of treatment are you going to get? That depends on what you're sick with. Okay, um, that's the information for the bacteria. I have uh, more information for you in the form of an assignment. So you do the assignment, you'll see what kind of um, information you get there. So here's a couple of examples of viruses. Uh, bacteria can be infected by viruses. Those are referred to as bacteriophage. Um, if you've heard of Hep A, you've heard of the Hepatitis A virus. The Hepatitis A virus um, can be exchanged by seafood. You can get contaminated food or water. Fecal matter is a way of getting Hep A infection or unprotected sex can be a form, a, a way of transmitting this sickness. Um, you, many of you have heard of the norovirus, the nor norwa or norwalk virus or stomach flu. This was a real common concern on cruise ships when people were still taking cruises. Uh, the norwalk virus could make many of the people on board sick. There's also the enteric virus and that's slightly different than Hep A. Enteric virus is just a stomach virus. Okay, so there's viruses as causing food infections. Now there's also uh, fungal agents that cause food infections. So here's a couple for fungi and molds. Um, if you have something called a mycotoxigenic fungi in yeast, 
it's the toxins that are released by the growth of fungi, yeast, and mold. So in my image here, I have a slice of bread, and the slice of bread is being infected by a, ye uh, a fungus, and the fungus, like Aspergillum fusarium, perhaps, uh, is forming these long stalks, and it has the sporangium at the end of the stalk, and the sporangium release the canidia and the spores are out. So the fungi are growing, releasing spores, making more fungi. Um, the material underneath the surface is referred to as the rhizoid. So the rhizoid is infecting below and the mycelia is forming on top. Um, if you are exposed to the mycotoxin aflatoxin, well, that is a known liver cancer causing toxin. And that's produced by the Aspergillus flavus. So if you have nuts, improperly stored ground nuts, hmm, it's a way of getting mycotoxin, aflatoxin, which can make liver cancer. It's, um, according to the World Food Health Organization, 25% of the world's food can have mycotoxin contamination. So that's a lot of contamination from, from something that can cause liver cancer. Here's another fungal disease. Uh, Candida albicans can cause oral thrush, especially in babies. And so you can see here the white pasty material on this tongue. It looks like uh, an unhappy child. The, the, they've obviously been infected with thrush. It's been shown there's another yeast bacteria, Pichia, uh, I'm gonna have fun with this last one, Grudis zevi. And this yeast has been used for a long time to make fermented cassava, cacao, fermented milk, also maize beverages. So this is more of a South American um, food yeast. And it's 99% identical to a candida bacteria. So this food back, uh, yeast, oh, sorry, I said bacteria, yeast, food yeast, the pitchia looks almost like candida and candida causes thrush. So if you're um, not sure you're, Foods can be contaminated with this uh, thrush causing organism. Here's a slide showing parasites. Again, I'm showing the life cycle of toxoplasma. Um, so the parasite for toxoplasma can be found in cattle, sheep, pigs. One of the hosts is mice. Um, you may have heard of mice that are not afraid of cats. This is the disease that causes brave mice. Uh, these mice get infected by the parasite and they're mentally changed. They are not scared of cats. The cats can capture them much easier. Uh, the cats ingest the mice and then they shed the feces. The feces contain the parasites in what are referred to as oocysts and changing the cat's litter box can spread the disease to people. Okay, so there's um, a way of catching this parasite from mice. And that's here 
down below. Oh, it's not even listed as one of the parasites. I guess I've uh, removed it here. Uh, but there is the beef tapeworm. Oh no, it's here. Toxoplasma gondii. So that's the name of the organism that causes that. Uh, there's also flatworm from pork. And the last one I'm just mention Giardia and intestinalis. Giardia is a microbe parasite. It's a eukaryotic parasite. This lives in water and gives you uh, a stomach infection. And it's referred to as beaver fever because a lot of people will go to a campsite and they'll swim in the water and ingest the water and get a Giardia infection. And uh, it's a fairly mild infection, but you do get sick from beaver fever. Okay, and then there's other food in based infections, uh, BSE, bovine spongiform in cows. So prions can form uh, plaques in the brain and causing the brain to become disabled. And people, or sorry, cows that have spongiform encephalopathy become disabled cows. People with uh, CJD, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, they've ingested spoiled meat, uh, meat poisoned with these prions, um, and they can get sick. And the same thing happens to their brains. They get these patches in their brains and they become disabled from these prion diseases. There's also a prion disease in sheep called scrapie. The, this disease is called scrapie on account of the sheep and goats that get this disease, they become mentally challenged to kind of What do they do? They, they scrape their heads against fences and without reason. So it, they seem kind of weird acting and the scrapey behavior is something seen in sheep and, sheep and goats. And it's known to be a prion disease. There's also chronic wasting disease in deer and moose and elk. Uh, some people call it the zombie elk or zombie deer disease where you, you have a deer that just kind of walks without a purpose and it's not scared of people it's just and it's looking very very sick and wasting away so the prions in the brain of these animals waste um, cause them to not be able to function properly there's also a disease known as kuru, and people, cannibals, that practice cannibalism uh, were found to have this prion disease. Um, I also mentioned a histamine poisoning called scombroid, that if you eat stale or rotten fish, you can get histamine poisoning from fish. So there's several different diseases out there. The ones I have on this page are mostly prion diseases. Okay, and then there's the questions based on some of these intoxications or infections. And there's some of the symptoms and that's it for my presentation. All right, so let's stop sharing that. All right. Okay, so um, that's all I have to say about that presentation. Um, that'll be lecture six next week, lecture seven. Thanks for listening. If you've managed to hang in there and listen to my information, um, the information at the end of this lecture is contained in assignment number, I think it's three.
um, that you can find online as a quiz. Good luck. Talk to you later. Good night. Good afternoon. Good morning. Wherever you are, whatever time you're at. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Chat with you later. Ciao.